Okay, well, hello, everybody. I hope everybody's doing fine. It is Friday morning about 11.20. Um, you know, I looked at the first uh, discussion questions, look, start looking at the second discussion questions. They will be graded later today. So now we're getting ready for a third discussion question. Now for DQ number three, what we're going to do is talk about applying one of the career development theories um, to diverse groups of clients that we will be working with in your, well, that I work with now that you guys will be working with in your future. Um, one of the things that we're going to do is add an outside source of information. So for this DQ number three, you can also cite the PowerPoints, you can cite the video lectures that we have, um, you can also cite outside textbooks, um, journal articles, and the like. Um, but make sure that you have three to four solid paragraphs. Essentially, like I was talking about, I like to have things, baby steps. So DQ1, just give, you know, everybody did great on that. I'll be posting the grades for DQ2 today with some feedback. And then this weekend will be DQ number three. Um, now, one thing that we need to talk about is the upcoming assignments. So I know the next one that is on the pike are the website reviews. I know you've been working on them for a while. Um, technically, they are due on June the 7th, so in a couple days. I have no problem extending that by a day or two if you need be. Why don't we do this? Since it's such a small class, there's only four of you and myself, so it's not like we have you know 25 students. Why don't we try to shoot for the 7th if you can get it in? That's great. If you need an extra day or two, that is completely fine without any penalty or anything like that. Just shoot me an email and let me know, hey, you know, I'd like to have an extra day or two. Totally cool. Now, for the website reviews, obviously some of the basics, the website address, um, a brief overview of the content, um, you know, specifically maybe it's tailored towards a population like traumatic brain injury or individuals diagnosed on the autism spectrum or orthopedic injuries or who knows what. Put in your opinion about the content quality. Accessibility, also comment on this. Now part of this assignment is figuring out how do you determine if a website is accessible. So you'll be able to do that by Googling how do you determine if a website is accessible. You'll, there's many different programs that you can use for free. Plug in the web address and then it will give you a basic report um, about that meaning accessibility. What if I have a hearing impairment? What if I have a vision impairment? Many times people don't even think about these types of things, but for our clients, this can be critically important. And if a website is not fully accessible, then they run afoul of the American with Disabilities Act and, and other federal legislation. Um, how was it to navigate on the website? Was it easy? Was it difficult? You know, put, put in some comments about that. And then your overall impression. So each one um, should have about, you know, two pages of content for each web page and so on. It shouldn't be that difficult. Now, coming up to the, the more, you know, assignments that are more applied, things that you'll actually be doing in the real world and making money in the future, will be the labor market survey and the job analysis. Now, the job analysis will be due on June the 14th and the labor market survey due on the 21st, a week later. Now, normally, like if you look at the syllabus for the job analysis, you're going out there and observing it in the real world. Um, you know, for our circumstances with COVID-19 and everything else going on in the world, this one time, this semester, we're going to cut you guys a break and not have you go out and do a job analysis um, and either the labor market survey. We'll just come up with a way to do it so you don't have to go out there and actually do it in the real world. Now, what I would suggest is doing the labor market survey and a job analysis on your future job that you hope to obtain after completing your master's degree here at GW. So rehabilitation counselor, um, vocational expert, um, you know, clinical mental health counselor, whatever kind of counselor you want to become, career. You know, for me, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor, so I do career counseling, clinical mental health counseling, rehabilitation counseling, and forensic counseling. So I kind of wear all the different hats because I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, but getting back to your assignments, so for the job analysis, do it on like, a, for example, a rehabilitation counselor. 
And the data that you can obtain would be from the ONET, the Department of Labor's ONET. You'll be able to print out like a seven or eight page, what's called a summary report. If you click on the different things, you can get a much longer report. But this report will give you information about the environment, the work duties, the, the roles and functions, the education required, the salary levels, the benefits, the growth. It will also have hauling codes, a two or three letter hauling code. Depend, you, you, we all know what hauling codes are, right? It's an interaction between the person's personality and work environment. And the theory is, is if your personality matches that work environment, then you are going to do better in that occupation and be more satisfied. Um, so do sources like that, like the ONET, the Occupational Outlook Handbook, uh, the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a lot of information. And when you look at the ONET, go down to the bottom and also pick whatever state you see yourself living in afterwards, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, California, New York, wherever you're going, and have in there as part of this assignment. Let's see, the key thing about labor market is pretend you're the client. And you want to figure out, okay, uh, I'm disabled at this point in time. You know, I'm going to hopefully go through a program of retraining to enable me to obtain an entry-level job in Occupation X. A labor market survey will provide data on, you know, are these jobs out there? What are they paying? What's the growth rate? What kind of benefits are you getting? So think about when you write up your labor market survey and also in our file section, there's two peer reviewed journal articles, one specifically on the methodology of creating a labor market survey. You might want to cite that in your um, labor market survey assignment. Okay, this is what the methodology is. This is how I approached it. I did X, Y, and Z. Here's my data sources. This is what I found that a rehabilitation counselor would earn in Virginia or wherever you are. And that will get us through um, the labor market survey. Now the job analysis, the one that's more pressing, you're going to use similar resources. So if you go to the ONET, you'll be able to get a lot of information on the specific work environment and equipment used and wage data. Then what I would do is I would also Google Department of Labor's DOT. And you'll be able to pull up a paragraph specifically on a rehabilitation counselor's duties. At the very bottom of that, it will have um, SVP, specific vocational preparation, how much education is required to get an entry-level job. And then it'll also have something called strength, which basically is a category determined by the Department of Labor of the physical exertion required to do this job. Sedentary, like this, working in a desk. Light is 10 to 20 pounds lifting, medium 25 to 50, heavy 50 to 100, and so on. So also comment on that because think about it. If we are training someone for job X and they can only lift 10 pounds, but job X requires 50 pounds lifting, then you know that's what a job analysis is really about to determine in collaboration with the treating physicians and psychologists and psychiatrists and whoever, depending on the case, um, can this person do this job? So before I would actually send someone to work, I would actually have them do, I uh, would complete a job analysis and send it to their treating physicians for approval. That's just the way I would do business. So, you know, if you have any questions about how we're going to do these, just shoot me an email. I'll get back to you within 24 hours or, or less. Um, but we are going to modify the labor market survey and job analysis so that you can do them just from your home, apartment, wherever, um, and not have to go out in the real world to do so. So let's talk about the chapter for this week. Um, so career counseling with diverse uh, populations. Going way back to Frank Parsons, I, I think I briefly mentioned him in our, one of our prior lectures, he wrote a book called Choosing a Vocation. Frank Parsons theory was a trait and factor theory where it essentially was a one-shot deal where they he was the expert. It wasn't really collaboration. He was the expert. Um, it was a linear development going from point A to point B in kind of a straight line. Um, and the first phase would be understanding, you know, what the client's all about, their skills, their aptitudes, their interests, their values, um, their intelligence, their limitations or abilities, and so, 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 so. Uh, the next one would be, okay, let's examine the work environment. Again, kind of like theory of congruence, but 50 years, 60 years beforehand, Okay, what's the work environment? What do they require? 
and then using logic and reasoning to match up the two to see if there's a good correlation or match, if you will, or fit between who the person is and the work environment. Now, the thing about Frank Parsons is it's not a one-shot deal anymore. Like my grandpa Brady, you know, he became an engineer and worked at Westinghouse his whole life, died, and he worked for one employer his whole life after he got out of the Navy in World War II. It just, the labor market's not like that anymore. So his theory, while some of the concepts are still valid, the way our labor market is, people can have many different employers, many different jobs. So that kind of doesn't really um, fit our current labor market the way it is. Um, really, after World War II, for rehabilitation counseling, that's really when we started growing tremendously. Backing up from a couple lectures ago, World War I, when a lot of soldiers were coming back and they were, had serious injuries, that's really when we first started doing rehabilitation counseling, trying to figure out how do we help these individuals. World War II, we had a lot more soldiers, a lot more people with disabilities, thus more people, you know, going to the legislature in D.C. and saying, hey, we need money for these programs. And really, after World War II in the 50s and 60s, that's when the VR programs really grow exponentially. Um, this is when other people started looking at Parsons' original work and building on it, like Super and Crumbles. Um, and it was more like a developmental theory, a lifelong versus a one-shot deal. And you can read these in, in the textbook. I, you can go through the different theories. Now, career counseling, to me, when I do career counseling, it's essentially educating the person about different occupations, um, letting them know what the roles and functions and duties and what an average day is going to be like, and also me getting to know them about what makes them tick, their strengths, their weaknesses, and trying to come up with some options and labor market data, what the wages and the you know benefits and is the is it growing? For example, nursing is an occupation that's growing rapidly versus, I don't know, elevator operator. That's negative. That there's really none of those jobs left anymore. So that's the kind of information that we would obtain in a labor market survey and provide to our clients so that they can make an informed decision. Um, so it's really an interpersonal process where we're working collaboratively and trying to move the person and guide them towards a logical decision that we feel would be best for them, but it's their life and they're going to make their choices. Um, and really what we want to try to do is have a congruence between who and what they are and what their goals and values, intelligence, personality, interests, and all that kind of stuff that make them up to what the work environment requires and demands. And hopefully with that being a good match, they're going to be okay. Nathan and Hill, uh, their model really kind of follows Parsons. It's three, three steps again, you know, screening, contacting, exploring options, enabling them to understand, and then making a plan and taking action. Crumboltz, I like his theory, uh, social learning theory. Basically, there's seven main steps. What's the problem? Let's define it. Let's figure out what's going on here. How can we help this individual? Point two, let's establish a plan, i.e. rehabilitation plan or individualized plan for employment. Number three, let's clarify the values. Next one, let's come up with some reasonable alternatives for the client so that they can consider them. Um, let's talk about the probable outcomes. Then let's eliminate some of the alternatives that don't really fit what the client's goals are. And then number seven, let's take the action. Let's go for it. Let's get you this occupation. Hopefully you can be very successful and not utilize our services anymore. Now, there's all, a whole bunch of different alternative models that are specified in the textbook. Yost and Cornishley, Spokane, Solomon, Guys Burz et al., Fogg, Brown and Books, and actually one, uh, the income framework that I developed with one of my mentors at the University of Maryland, Dr. David Hershenson. Um, if you see that on page, whatever page was it, it's in, in the textbook near the end. That was a theory that we developed at the University of Maryland um, when I was finishing my PhD before I came to GW. And I don't know if I have that article in the file section or not. If you guys would like to look at it, I'd be happy to give it to you. But essentially, the income framework, well, let's talk about it. So let's, let's back off on that before we'll get a little more in detail. So interest inventories, like the self-directed search. You saw in the vocational assessment that I provided online for you 
that I use the SDS all the time. I've given it thousands of times. I utilize those Holland codes in my analysis of where we are with this individual and what are our future goals and how we're going to get there. Uh, the Dictionary Occupational Codes, that's another thing that I've used a lot. Um, there's the World of Work Inventory. There's many different instruments that are based on Holland's theory. Um, there's a good book called What is the Color of Your Parachute that you might want to consider looking at. Um, the Job Search Handbook for People with Disabilities. There's all kinds of good resources in there. One of the things that you can utilize in your future work are what's called job clubs. This is kind of like a group counseling, if you will, that's focused on helping people obtain suitable gainful employment. Um, career genograms. I don't know if you noticed in that report, but I do a genogram in like a chart format looking at mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and whoever else was important in this person's development. You know, what's their educational background? What's their vocational background? What kind of jobs have they held? Have they had steady employment? Um, have they never worked in their life? Um, and so on. Because really the mother is the most robust predictor of what's going to happen with the individual you're working with. But the family tree has an influence on the types of jobs and occupations that they will be shooting for. Transferable skills analysis. Now many people working as rehabilitation counselors do this every day. Essentially what a TSA is, is we look at Johnny or Jane and let's assume they have a work history. So we look at what kind of jobs they had in the past and what skills that they learned that they can transfer into the labor market that we could utilize those current skills and build upon them perhaps through additional education or training or reasonable accommodations or what have you to help facilitate their career development. Um, you know, experiential interventions, you know, informational interviews. This is a great way to say you're working with someone that has been disabled for a period of time and hasn't went on an interview for a long time. Or maybe it's a way to give them some more education, basically getting it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. They'll go out there, see what the job is all about, and that will give them more information that maybe this occupation is right or maybe, conversely, it's not right for me. So there's a couple goals for informational interviewing. Job shadowing, following some around the job, same type of thing. They'll be able to obtain more evidence and information about is this job for me or not. Um, volunteering, many times again, I would have my clients volunteer in jobs for a couple reasons. Number one, they're going to get out of the house and be more active. Number two, obtain new job skills. Number three, we can update their resume with some work history versus, okay, I see you haven't worked here in five years. What's been going on? Internships. I don't need to talk to you guys about internships because you're probably going to do them, have done them, or you know, you probably have done them in your past. It's a great way. A lot of people don't have the luxury of having internships, but it's a great way to learn the skills and again gain more information. Um, trial work experience, just what it says. Give it a shot, see how it works, and if it doesn't work out, we'll go back to plan B. Um, and supportive employment, this is for people that have serious um, injuries and limited transferable skills and you know competitive employment is not going to be for them. Um, you know career counseling persons with disabilities again the income framework is mentioned in the textbook um, and briefly what it has to do is when does the disability occur? Have you been born with it? Did it happen mid-career or did it happen late career? And there's really a couple parts of this imagining if you remember Frank Parsons his beginning was, okay, let's figure out who this person is and their strengths and weaknesses, and then let's start looking at work environments. So imagining this is where the client starts you know, thinking, okay, what kind of jobs might be for me? Informing, this is where they actually go out and collect information. Could be the informational interview, job shadowing, volunteering, and so on. Choosing, this is where the client actually makes a choice. Okay, I'm going to become a rehabilitation counselor. Obtaining, this is where we do the job placement and perhaps do a job analysis and help them get that job. Maintaining it, this is when people kind of become my age and maybe they've been doing it for a while and we need to get better skills. And then exiting, we're preparing for our retirement and so on. So that is our chapter in a nutshell. If you have any questions about um, this chapter, please let me know. And again, I'm totally cool if we need to um, extend the deadline for the website reviews 
not a problem at all. Just send, shoot me an email, say, hey, Dr. B, I'd like to have an extra couple of days. Totally cool with me. Um, and I think that's about it. So let me know if you guys need anything. I hope everybody's staying st safe and, you know, a lot of crazy things going on in this world. Just you know, focus on our class. Keep doing a good job. And if you need anything, please let me know. Sorry, the landscapers are out there cutting the grass right now. So my apologies about that. But please do reach out to me if you need anything. And just keep up the good work. The grades for DQ number two will be showing up in a few hours. And um, just keep up the good work. Take care.